la, el, nom el nombre de la presentación es Correcting Seismic and Exotropy in Depth Imaging Using Geologically Constrained Velocity Models, como comentaba eh, Saidi hace un segundo. Iluminación sísmica en profundidad, eh, utilizando técnicas de isotropía sísmica y modelos geológicamente construidos. Antes de hacer la presentación, vamos a darnos dos segundos para comentarles lo que salió en el boletín de la SOBG de este mes pasado. Luego tendremos la presentación a las 2 y 5. 45 minutos durará la presentación y al final vamos a cerrar con preguntas. Eh, por favor, las preguntas las pueden escribir en inglés en el chat o las pueden eh, comentar al final en inglés o si desean alguna traducción, por favor la escriben en el chat también, que nosotros nos encargamos de traducirse a Rob. En la actualidad de la SVG tenemos los siguientes puntos. Eh, este mes pasado se inició el primer Ready to Work Venezuela 2021. Este programa, bajo su modalidad virtual, fue organizado por primera vez en Venezuela por el capítulo de los Young Professionals de la AAPG y patrocinado por la APG, Capítulo eh, Latinoamérica y el Caribe. Inició el pasado 21 de junio y fue diseñado para ayudar a reforzar las habilidades técnicas y dar apoyo en áreas como trabajo en equipo y liderazgo para jóvenes profesionales y estudiantes de los últimos años de las carreras de geociencia. Este contó con la participación de 39 estudiantes de la Universidad, Universidad Central de Venezuela, la Universidad de los Andes, la Universidad Simón Bolívar, la UNEYES, la Universidad de Oriente y LUZ. El estudiante Renato Quintero, seleccionado para participar en el SLS. Desde la Sociedad Venezolana de Ingenieros Geofísicos, extendemos nuestras más sinceras felicitaciones al estudiante Renato Quintero de la Universidad Simón Bolívar y actual tesorero del capítulo estudiantil de la SG USB, quien fue seleccionado para participar en el evento de la SG Chevron Student Symposium de Liderazgo. La AAPG Student Chapter de la UCB y la USB, ganadores de la beca LOB. Desde la SOBG extendemos nuestras más sinceras felicitaciones a estos capítulos estudiantiles de dichas universidades por resultar ganadores de las becas. De la beca L. Austin Wicks de para las organizaciones estudiantiles durante el año 2021. Esta fue otorgada por la fundación de la EPG, la cual permitirá a ambos capítulos seguir desarrollando las actividades para la formación de los estudiantes de geociencia en sus universidades. En sus universidades disculpen. Queremos también darle las gracias a la compañía eh, Reservoir Consultants por hacer un ciclo de entrenamiento y capacitaciones durante los meses de junio y julio. Esta compañía ha otorgado un cupo a la sociedad para sus cursos técnicos que van a ser dictados de manera online. Actualmente la SOBG cuenta con 400 miembros y creciendo. Si usted todavía no se ha registrado, puede seguir el link, la información online y registrarse sin costo alguno para volverse miembro de la sociedad y disfrutar de los beneficios que ella ofrece. Este evento todavía busca patrocinantes. Si usted o su compañía desea patrocinar el evento de la conferencia mensual de la SOBG, puede contactarnos por email, por Facebook o cualquiera de estas redes sociales. En el mes de agosto vamos a tener al señor Máster Joaquín Aristimuño, quien hará una presentación de inversión sísmica basada en fases aplicadas en yacimientos de crudo pesado. Presentación del día, Correcting Seismic and Isotropy in Depth Imaging Using Geologically Constrained Velocity Models. Muchas gracias, señor Rob Bestrom, por eh, atender este llamado y venir a hacer su presentación. Rob tiene un máster en geofísica de la Universidad de Alberta en Canadá y estudios de doctorado en la Universidad de Calgary. Su tesis doctoral fue en el tópico de la iluminación sísmica anisotrópica, donde él formó, formó parte del proyecto de investigación de las Foothills, es un, el cual era un consorcio para estudiar geología estructural e iluminación sísmica en esas zonas complejas. Rob 
trabajó en proyectos de iluminación o migración sísmica desde el año 1996. Comenzó su carrera en Shell, Canadá, y luego trabajó en desarrollos tecnológicos en Kelma Technologies y en la extinta compañía Veritas en Calgary. Rob ha dictado cursos de procesamiento sísmico en, todos, en muchos lugares del mundo desde hace 15 años, incluyendo Argentina, Dinamarca, Colombia, Bolivia, Inglaterra, India, Pakistán y Nueva Guinea. Muchas gracias, Rob. Y sin, sin más eh, tiempo que robar de la presentación, Rob, thank you so much for coming today to give us your uh, uh, presentation. Uh, we're going to have closed captioning here for people to follow along. And if they have questions, they're going to post them on the chat or have them at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Rob. You can take control of the screen now. My pleasure. Thank you for... Uh... Thank you for inviting me to speak. I just need to figure this out. Um, and then now, do you see a title slide? Uh, it's coming. Have I succeeded? Yes, it's there right now, good. Okay, I hope these don't come up on my screen. Um, so yeah, thank you for the introduction and thank you for, for attending and, and for your attention. I, uh, we're going to be talking about my two favorite topics today, seismic anisotropy and structural geology. So sometimes I get kind of excited about these topics and I'll be careful not to talk too quickly. If, uh, if, I, if I get a bit carried away and if I start to speak quickly, please interrupt and let me know and I can, I can back up and, and clarify. So the title of my talk today, as Gabriel mentioned, we're I'm talking about correcting for seismic anisotropy in-depth imaging of seismic data using geologically constrained velocity models. So, and anisotropy causes imaging and position issues on seismic data. And structural geology is a key lever to the solution to those problems, to correcting those issues. Oh, 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 here we go. Okay. So this is the problem. This is our, our enemy, is the dipping clastic overburden. We have interbedded sands, shales, and, and uh, limestones. We end up, we, we've got, a, in this case, we've got these steeply dipping rocks at surface. We've got a higher velocity in the direction parallel to bedding, a lower velocity in the direction perpendicular to bedding, and this can cause all kinds of problems in the subsurface, which I'll explain, and uh, we'll show you the, the solutions at the end. So seismic anisotropy is, a, I find, a fascinating topic, and, and I hope you find it interesting as well. I have a few videos and some explanations for how, uh, how these, uh, these effects occur in wave propagation. And basically what we're looking at is we've got, in the direction parallel to bedding, we've got this high velocity direction, and, uh, and we've got this low velocity direction perpendicular to bedding. And... Um, and so then what happens is we've got, uh, there are two effects at play. One of them is this preferential alignment of clay minerals on the microscopic scale. So we have uh, in shales, we've got these clay minerals, uh, they're in a, like a shape of a plate or like a coin, and they tend to lay themselves down flat. So we have, uh, you know, relative to gravity. And uh, so the material would be a lot more grain supported in the horizontal direction and less grain supported in the direction uh, normal to, to the gravity. And uh, so we'll end up with a, a, um, a lower velocity. Uh, the material is more compressible in this direction and less compressible in this direction. What I think is a little more intuitive to understand, I'm not thinking about logically about the, the um, rock physics, but thinking about a seismic wavelength. And if that seismic wavelength is much larger than our layering, even if our layers are isotropic or have the velocity is the same in all directions, but we've got a low velocity material and a high velocity material and they oscillate, uh, they alternate in this layering system, we can end up with, sorry, I didn't mean to start that so quickly. We can end up with a, with a situation where the, uh, the seismic waves uh, have a different compressional behavior, uh, normal to bedding and parallel to bedding. I was thinking about this yesterday, and I have a cleaning sponge that I use that has a, a very firm, uh, scratchy uh, surface on one side of the sponge, and on the other, it's it's fine and, uh, and and a bit more squishy. So if we look at how this how this behaves, 
the 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 coarse material is uh is not very compressible it's difficult for me to compress and the yellow material is very easily compressed and then they kind of interact together uh combining this this uh these two layers together now if we think about this as a, a series of layering like if i combine all of these together the material is quite compressible in the direction normal to bedding even though the green layers don't compress very much, the yellow layers compress quite readily. And, uh, and this material is quite compressible. So then it has a low compressional velocity in the direction of normal to bedding. If we have, uh, if I try to squish this material horizontally or parallel to bedding, I have a difficult time getting the squishing going on because the, the stiff layers, the less compressible green layers uh, are what is resisting the compression. And so you can see uh, just with a simple uh, explanation uh, how we would end up with a, a lower compressional velocity in the direction normal to bedding and a higher compressional velocity parallel to bedding in the rock layers if we think about this analog of something we could squish with our hands. So this is, uh, uh, and when we talk about anisotropy and how the velocity changes with direction, it's important for us to think about symmetry so isotropic uh, velocities so the velocity is the same in all directions is a type of symmetry another type of symmetry is what we call vertical transverse isotropy it's an unfortunate name uh, for a symmetry class because we're it's used to describe a type of anisotropy and yet it has the word isotropy in the name geophysics uh, word terminology doesn't always necessarily make a lot of sense but in this case of so the vertical transverse isotropy, so just like we saw with the sponges in the last uh, slide, whether we've got a low velocity in the direction normal to bedding, and we've got a high velocity in the direction parallel to bedding, but there are a lot of directions that are parallel to bedding. So then these are all the same. So transverse isotropy, it refers to the fact that the, the velocity is the same or isotropic in all directions transverse to the bedding plane normal. So that's why it's called vertical transverse isotropy. Well, it's called transverse isotropy because of the, the same velocity at all directions parallel to bedding, and then a lower velocity as we go to the direction normal to bedding. And vertical transverse isotropy is, talks about the case where we have horizontal layers. If our layers are perfectly horizontal, then we end up with this VTI case, which we don't see we see that in a, in a planes, a high plane setting, but we don't see it in uh, in a thrust belt setting very often. So again, back to this uh, slide I showed earlier with this high velocity parallel to bedding, low velocity perpendicular to bedding. The most common terminal, the parameterization for uh, for the anisotropy is from Thompson's uh, paper uh, in, in geophysics. It was the most cited paper in geophysics, and it refers to Thompson's epsilon and delta, where they define uh, the velocity as it changes with direction. So the epsilon gives us basically the difference between the velocity uh, parallel to bedding and the velocity normal to bedding. It's normalized by the velocity normal to bedding, so it's just the amount, uh, uh, like the amount the velocity increases when you go from the bedding plane normal to the bedding parallel. So, for example, if epsilon is 0.1 or 10%, then the velocity increases by 10% if we go from the direction normal to bedding to the direction parallel to bedding. That's reasonably intuitive, I think. Um, it's more difficult to think about what's happening with delta. Delta describes the behavior of the velocity at angles oblique to bedding. So near the bedding plane normal and, and away from that, then delta has the influence over the velocity as it changes with direction. So, um, and delta tends to be small. There was a research topic, um, it just didn't happen in the real world called elliptical anisotropy where a delta was equal to epsilon. And that doesn't happen in the real world. Delta tends to be much smaller than epsilon. And, um, and uh, I'll, I'll explain the, the, how we observe that in, in a few slides. Just uh, some observations of seismic anisotropy. Uh, this is from the University of Calgary Foothills Research Project in the 1990s. 
uh, from or Jennifer Leslie's thesis work. She recruited the field school uh, from the University of Calgary um, to be her um, her field uh, to do do the field work required for her thesis, which was great. And um, and these are transects of refraction surveys uh, along along the along the surface. This is a satellite map view. And uh, the bedding, this is this line is oriented um, parallel to bedding. And the, the, the uh, rocks come to, come to surface at a very steep angle, 70 degrees and greater. So they're near vertical beds. And, uh, and this is the direction parallel to bedding. And this is the direction perpendicular to bedding. And then we've got this 45 degree angle in between. And there was another survey uh, to the north. And she collected data from both of these surveys and graph them up with the, using the minus time method so to get the velocities from the slopes of the strike uh, direction, the dip direction, and the 45 degree uh, direction. And here are her results. In the strike direction, she had a velocity of 3,800 meters per second, which is really high for rocks coming to surface. Um, and then in the, in the dip direction, uh, 3,100 meters per second. So there's, there's a considerable difference. In fact, 23% is the difference between um, the strike and dip velocity. So epsilon is 0.23, plus or minus uh, experimental uncertainty. Um, at 45 degrees, this is common. We have the, the velocity is quite close to the dip velocity. So there's not much change in velocity as we go from the, the normal to bedding direction to the 45 degrees to bedding direction. And uh, that gave us a delta that's basically zero. The magnitude of delta calculated from these velocities um, is smaller than the experimental uncertainty. So delta tends to be small and, uh, and ep epsilon can be pretty big. Now, this is, this is a, a lot of years ago now, and uh, it was a surprise to us uh, doing seismic imaging in the, in the foothills type areas uh, and doing VSP work, like using multi-offset VSPs to, to get anisotropic parameters in the, in the same region, because we observed in seismic imaging, surface seismic and uh, VSP seismic, that the epsilon value would be about half of, half of this, or like 0.12. And uh, later studies from the University of Alberta and the rock physics lab there had uh, observed that uh, there's not much difference in anisotropy is not very, uh, pardon me. So the anisotropy is not affected by pressure to a large extent by the confining pressure of the in situ um, rock, but, uh, but it is affected by pressure when the pressure, when the lithostatic load is removed altogether. So if a rock comes to surface, the theory is that the bedding planes delaminate and fractures open up and the anisotropy increases significantly when these rocks are at surface. Whereas in the subsurface that we're in, they're at confining pressure, then the, the anisotropy is, is slightly less. Well, maybe about half in this case. So how does this affect our seismic data? Well, here's a velocity curve We've got the, the direction normal to bedding and the direction parallel to bedding. And the bedding is in the background of the image here. Uh, I, if, we had the, if the velocity stayed the same in all directions, so we would end up with this, we could display the velocity as a circle. So the radius out from the origin is the same in all directions. We, we, this isotropic velocity is a circle. And then if we have anisotropic velocity, we'll end up with this higher velocity in the direction parallel to bedding and it, it takes a, some a certain amount of angle before we get to the place where the anisotropic velocity deviates from the isotropic case. And so this is uh, what we have observed over time on, uh, on, on seismic images. If we look at the, uh, at the uh, travel time with respect to offset, for a certain range of offsets, the isotropic assumption works out quite well. And, uh, and we can predict the behavior based on uh, on this, the isotropic assumption. And then if we correct for, uh, correct for those image gathers uh, using, uh, ignoring the anisotropy, uh, what we will see at the long offsets is there's going to be reduced travel time 
of these long offsets due to the higher velocity uh, the, 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 the anisotropic velocity is higher than the assumed isotropic velocity. And how that looks in practice is you've got a certain range of traces where you've got a pretty, or if you correct for them, ignoring the anisotropy, we can get actually quite a flat image gather with offset increases to the right at this one image point on the subsurface. And then as we get to the longer and longer offset, there's going to be an area where the, uh, the reduced travel time uh, is going to result in overcorrection of this move out. And, uh, and then we have this, uh, we have this hockey, what we call the hockey stick effect, where it, it, it's straight for a certain range, and then it curves upwards for a certain range. And we can correct for this, uh, correct for this by correcting for, for anisotropy using um, uh, anisotropic correction. Uh, for for VTI for the VTI case, and this is oftentimes um, well, I'll talk about this again in a few minutes. Uh, but this hockey stick effect is uh, is an interesting diagnostic that finds um, uh, VTI uh, VTI anisotropy. Now, sometimes um, one might conclude that there, if we don't see hockey sticks, we don't have anisotropy in the subsurface. And that's really not the case. Uh, it's just that if we don't see hockey sticks, we might not see VTI anisotropy, but we might see dipping uh, anisotropy. And we'll talk about dip layers and the effect of dip in a few minutes. Okay, so here's a velocity curve that I showed earlier, and the long offsets are going to see a reduced travel time because of the higher velocity as we get to these angles oblique to bedding. And now if we think about uh, for TTI media, so if we've got a, uh, uh, these rock layers are, are t dipping, rock layers are, are tilted, um, then, uh, then we've got, uh, it's going to be a different geometry altogether. And we're going to see um, uh, some lateral position issues uh, with respect to the anisotropy and of, of course because of the dip of the reflector. So here is uh, just, a, just a photograph from an outcrop just west of Calgary. Please come visit and see our Canadian Rocky Mountains. And uh, if we've got uh, the, this case here where we've got the velocity and the direction uh, parallel to bedding is the highest velocity and the direction perpendicular to bedding is a lower velocity, then if we shoot off a source at this location, then the wavefront is going to be uh, going into the subsurface in this direction here. So this would be our wavefront in the subsurface, uh, which is skewed toward the high velocity direction. Uh, so that's reasonably intuitive, but what's more interesting is the point of deepest penetration of this wavefront is not below the source location. It's shifted laterally over. So we can draw a line to connect the point below the, uh, below the source location and the point of deepest penetration of the wavefront. And this is what we call the side slip effect, where the, the energy along the wavefront is slipping sideways. It's like shifting over uh, to the side toward the high velocity direction. And I have a, a video that shows that. So this is a snapshot of a seismic wave at a fixed time. So we've shot the source. At a, some time later, we've stopped the wavefront. That's just propagating into the subsurface. It's traveled, at this time, it's traveled a higher, a greater distance in the higher velocity direction. It's also traveled a shorter distance in low velocity direction, which looks like we saw in the previous uh, image of the outcrop. And this point of deepest penetration is over here. So this line follows the point of deepest penetration into the subsurface. And this just does a vertical line uh, from the source location down to the reflector. So the side slip effect is this um, lateral shift of the wavefront. So there must be some motion that's normal to the wavefront going downwards. And it would have to also be uh, some motion tangential to the wavefront, which is the side slip effect in order for the energy to get from here to here. So if we watch this uh, movie as it impinges on the interface, it, uh, it is going to hit the interface here and then it's going to reflect. Now, in reflecting, uh, the uh, motion normal to the uh, 
normal to the wavefront is going to reflect and goes back upwards. Now the side slip effects, interestingly enough, also reflects, or it's not, it doesn't really reflect per se, and, and that the side slip effect just goes toward the high velocity direction. So it downwards, it's going, it's side slipping toward the higher velocity direction. And when it goes upwards, it's also going to slide toward the high velocity direction. So if we watch this uh, movie go uh, upwards, the, the wave go upwards, it follows this down, images the subsurface over here, and goes back up to the surface. So what we see here is uh, this is the ray path for the zero offset reflection. Um, it, and so we shoot the source, image the subsurface here, and that energy comes back up to the source location. And, and we've imaged the subsurface over here, but if we ignore anisotropy, we've got a horizontal reflector below a homogeneous overburden. And, um, and then we would, uh, if, if we ignore the anisotropy, we would put that reflection energy here, but really it should be uh, placed in this lateral position over there. And I'll show you how that works on seismic data, just so you can just see the effect of it. Um, I'm going to start in this case with uh, pre stack time migration, just to compare time migration to isotropic death migration and then anisotropic death migration. The geometry here, we've got an overthrust. So we've got older rocks thrust up over younger rocks. We've got a big velocity inversion. Uh, so there's ray bending at this interface as a result. And uh, in the pre stack time migration, it's the most robust imaging in our toolkit. Um, because we have the luxury of picking a RMS average velocity down to each reflector that averages through all of the effects in the near surface. So we don't have to worry about the, the geometry of the near surface. All we have to worry about is what average velocity down to here is going to image that one reflector. So it's, it's a great method for um, if we don't have, understand the geology, we can't really build a, a geologic model. Then, then we can get a, a good robust image. So in this case, this image in the blue, uh, circled by blue is, is imaged really quite well. The image circled by in the green is imaged okay, but uh, we, it's a duplex system that we hope we could image better. So here's one structure, here's another, it sits on top of it, and here is potentially a third one. Now I've displayed all these images in time, scaled back to time, so we only see the lateral shift and not the vertical shift. And if we go from uh, time to depth, so here's the time migration, here's the depth migration, um, we can see we've gotten with this uh, complex ray paths in the near surface, we've been able to image uh, or improve the imaging of this duplex system. So before and after, we've got tighter and stronger imaging in this duplex. Now this was the big frustration and this is where I ended up working in uh, because my educational background is in seismic anisotropy and I was very interested in working in, in the foothills of Canada in depth imaging but it was always very frustrating because we could if we pick a velocity model up here uh, because depth migration we have uh, we have this geologic model and we're ray tracing through to calculate travel times to image this structure and we ray trace through the same overburden to, to uh, image this structure. Uh, so because the velocity changes with direction, we would need to have a low velocity because the, the rays are running normal to bedding. We need a low velocity to image this structure, but this imaging is now weak. But if we, uh, if we create a velocity model that has higher velocity, because these rays that image this structure are passing through the higher velocity direction, then we could image this structure, but this imaging would be weak on this side. So when we start to correct for seismic anisotropy, a few things happen. Now we're able to get a one velocity model that is able to image both structures, so that's great news. Uh, we can also observe the lateral position shift. So correcting for anisotropy, uh, so here's the, uh, the before and after before and after correcting for anisotropy. So we can see this lateral shift in the seismic image that we uh, had observed uh, with the wave propagation. So now the structure is imaged in a more accurate position. 
And one thing the, about the death migration, because it's a more delicate process than time migration, if we look at two different model scenarios, so in this case, ignoring anisotropy and correcting for anisotropy, we can see the imaging, the coherency of the reflectors is considerably better. The edges of the these imbricates is much sharper. So the we don't really see the edges of these structures very well. Whereas here, we can see the leading edge uh, and the fault truncations of the structures. And we've got stronger and sharper coherency. So this is also a sign that our geologic model is more accurate because we're able to improve the imaging. Now notice that, that we've got this lateral position shift on the right side uh, under within the green structure because of this dip is going down to the left above it. Uh, interest, this is what I find more interesting is that where we've got the massive syncline in through here, we've got lateral varying uh, dip in the uh, in the overburden, and so then we've got uh, with the side slip effect is going to shift uh, is going to shift one way on the left and the other way on the right, and when we apply that uh, that correction, uh, we can heal the base of the syncline. So anisotropy has pulled the uh, imaging of the base of the syncline apart, and when we correct for anisotropy, we can heal the base of the syncline. Also, uh, this lateral position shift, this structure has, has broken apart uh, because the right side of the structure has shifted to the right, left side of the structure has shifted to the left, and when we correct for that, we get this nice tight structure imaged uh, throughout. So it's, uh, there's a lot of information here. We can see the lateral position change. We can see the effect of scenario testing for different geologic models, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. I said earlier I was going to talk about uh, um, uh, this hockey stick effect and why we don't always see hockey sticks on our seismic data. I had, this is part of a study I did years ago, uh, published in um, uh, first break, oh no, sorry, I'll have to find the publication for it. Um, the uh, geophysical prospecting, sorry, geophysical, the EAGE geophysical prospecting. And um, this is a numerical modeling study where we had this uh, a model with a horizontal reflector that has this sharp edge on it at two kilometers uh, in depth of the model. And the edge of it is two kilometers also into the model. And then we, uh, we created um, anisotropic forward models. And then we migrated the data, ignoring the anisotropy. And we did a variety of models with varying the overburden dip. So we've got VTI horizontal layers, TTI, um, or tilted transverse isotropy, where we've got 15 degrees dip, 30 degrees dip, and 45. So these are how the, the data looks like with those, um, with those models. Um, and the modeling procedure is we, uh, we built uh, anisotropic forward models, varying the overburden dip, and then uh, we did isotropic migration. So we ignored the anisotropy and we just optimized the imaging. So here are the, the image gathers from isotropic death migration using the true vertical velocity. And, uh, and you can see the, the, uh, the image gathers are smiling. We, we need to have a higher velocity to flatten that image gather. And if we, if we flatten that image gather, then, uh, then the structure is going to be imaged too deep. And this is a common problem. So we, this is image, image gathers with the optimum imaging velocity. And uh, note that we've got the long offset. We don't actually have a hockey stick that's pointing upwards. And I'll show you why that is. So just like we saw on the, on the image gather from the, from the surface seismic data earlier on, uh, we've got a certain range. We've got the flat gather on the near offsets. That's great. And then we have this hockey stick on the far offsets, which is a commonly observed phenomenon. And, uh, and the, the imaging velocity is, is 3,150 meters per second. Uh, so 5% higher than the true vertical velocity. So the reflector is 5% deeper than the true uh, depth of the reflector. Now, if we do the, same, uh, do the same experiment with 15 degrees dip, now we've got this lesser angle on the hockey stick because now the curvature is, of the move out is changing because now our, our uh, velocity curve is now tilted or, or dipping. 
And uh, if we go to to uh, 30 degrees dip, now we get actually get this over this downturned hockey stick. So they're where the long offset curvature points downwards. And that's also appearing at a, a yet a different depth. So 15 degrees, uh, 15 degrees, and then 30 degrees. And if we uh, if we look at the 40 degree, 45 degree case, uh, then we have more, even more during downturn on our hockey stick. And interestingly enough, less depth there. Let's see if I can. See if I can go backwards. Ugh, pardon me. Zoom is definitely interfering with my slide control. Okay, so we've got this. Uh, so we go from the VTI case, 15 degrees dip, the structure gets imaged even deeper, and 30 degree dip, deeper still. And then as we, uh, when we get to 45 degree dip, we actually have less of a depth there and more downturn on the hockey stick. So this just shows that we we may or may not see the whole hockey stick effect if we've got dipping rock layers above our target. And here's the the how this result turned out. The, here's the target. If we stack the image gathers uh, with a 30 degree TTI model, we end up with not only do we end up with a structure too deep, but because of the side slip effect, we end up with the structure image laterally over in this uh, 225 meters or a little more than 10% of the depth of the reflector. And then here's the position of the image target uh, if we correct for the anisotropy in the depth migration. Now that those are I've shown you examples of this, uh, you know, horizontal, uh, you know, the VTI case. But in a thrust belt environment, we've got this uh, varying dip uh, where you've got uh, a lot of variation in the dip of the anisotropic strata. And so then we, we are, we're going to need to uh, we're going to need to build a, a detailed geologic model that has all of this dip information and the dip geometry in it so that we know what direction. So the velocity is is highest in the direction parallel to bedding. So it's very important to know the um, uh, that direction, what direction is parallel to bedding. So when we record seismic reflection data, we don't know where the reflection energy originated. And we need to know the velocity structure of the subsurface in order to image the seismic data. But if we already know the subsurface structure, then we don't need seismic data. We make some simplifying assumptions and apply geologic understanding to constrain the velocity model. So model building for depth migration. This is where we where we need to have our um, we need to have our geologic constraints as is the with the seismic data in a thrust belt environment. Um, even in, on a on a beautiful seismic data like set like this one, where we've got gently varying structures in the overburden, um, and fairly well behaved velocities and several reflectors on our stack section, then we don't really see much on the pre stack data. So this is where the data-driven effects don't work very well on uh, on the seismic seismic imaging uh, seismic depth migration in a foothills type setting, because the near surface is the lens through which we see the subsurface, and we've got very low fold. We only have a few traces in the in the in the near surface. Uh, you know, going this, these are image gathers. Offset is increasing to the right. And the near surface, we only have very, we have very low fold. So the the area where we need to know the velocity structure the best has the weakest uh, has the least amount of information. Also, you can see that you could count uh, a dozen uh, reflectors on the stack section, but we only see two or three reflectors on the pre-stack data. And you can see they're reasonably flat. So I trust a human to have a look at this and say, okay, well these look reasonably flat. But I wouldn't trust the machine, the computer, to to try to invert for uh, the velocity structure. And the, again, this is a, a, a not a very complex data set, and we oftentimes we see dramatic velocity variation. And the example I'll show in a minute definitely shows some significant velocity variation. So what we what we do? This is a, a, a velocity analysis package called Structures. Um, and we have, we have an interpretive interface um, to draw the velocity boundaries. 
In 3D, we use OpenDetect from DGB uh, in Holland. It's actually free to download, and I recommend using it as an interpretation package. Uh, their model is to is to uh, sell plugins and commercial licenses, and and we've purchased plugins and we've gotten them to add our own customization into the software, which has been great. Anyway, so whatever tool we're using, we interpret the uh, the velocity interfaces, the velocity boundaries, and in this case, we've got the rays that show where we illuminated the subsurface. So if we want to Im fix the image gather here we can look over this whole entire range to find out where we might need to have higher or lower velocities. So with interpretive model building, we build the structural model and interpretive collaboration is key because uh, as I mentioned with the low data, low data density, uh, low signal to noise and, uh, and high geologic complexity. So we base the whole thing on structural geology we include TTI anisotropy right from the beginning of our process because we know that the consequences of ignoring anisotropy are great and it will be quite a different velocity structure that we would interpret uh, if we are ignoring the anisotropy. We use the velocities corresponding to the individual rock units. So we do expect them, like unlike presect time migration where we just use a it's just an imaging parameter to average through all of the overburden. We expect this geologic model um, to make geologic sense. And then we consider the model scale that affects travel times. So thickness is greater than 200 meters. We really want to think about the velocity effects in terms of multiple seismic wavelengths. So um, if we have a rock layer that's smaller than a seismic wavelength, it's going, it's going to have very little effect on the, uh, on the travel times for the imaging. And even, even on the order of a seismic wavelength is not really significant. So we want we, we combine layers that are, are less than 200 meters, for example, and, and, and put, uh, you know, apply gradients or whatever we need to do within those layers. The sensitivity of imaging to model velocity decreases with depth. So it's very important for us to think about the near surface layers, even though uh, the, stand, the you know, typical interp explorationist interpreter is going to put a lot more effort into the subsurface detail as opposed to the near surface detail. And then we test model scenarios based on seismic imaging diagnostics and interpreter and geologic input. So here's the workflow. It's really quite simple. The inputs are in orange. We've got the interpretation and the processed gathers that have noise, some noise attenuation and static corrections for the near surface. We build the velocity model from the interpretation and we migrate. And then we see, look at the output and we decide is the, we ask ourselves the tough questions. Is the image optimized? Does it compare well to the, uh, to the Kirchhoff presec time migration? Have we, do we see an imaging improvement? Do the wells tie? Are the reflector depths accurate with regard to any, any well information that we have? And typically the answer is no. It doesn't, it doesn't look great. Um, and the wells are not tying. But that's all information for us. So we say, okay, well, imaging is poor on this side of the section, but good on this side of the section. Uh, what can we change and what can we test to get that to, to optimize the imaging? Also, uh, any wells miss tie. So if the well is, if the reflector is too deep, then we can decrease the velocity. The reflector is too high, we can increase the velocity to get that well to tie. And then we have a new velocity model and we migrate again. And uh, eventually we get to start saying yes to some of these questions after six or 10 times maybe. And, uh, and then we just do some simple, like a coherency filter, bit of residual movement on the image gathers and then create our, size, our final volume. So I've got a, a data example that I'll show you from the Columbia Foothills. It's got high signal to noise um, generally uh, for a Foothills type setting. We've got strong RTM results in the strong uh, signal areas, but the Kirchhoff PSDM is more robust in this area, in the area of higher model uncertainty. So here's the structural setting. We've got uh, uh, overthrusted rocks and it's very steep and some areas overturned limbs and the hang wall of these thrusts. We've got a massive syncline coming out into the high plains over here and another major thrust carrying structures to surface. Now notice, because now here is where the exploration targets are, there's quite a bit of detail 
in the interpretation here because these are some of these are going to be reservoir units and that's very important for us it's more important to have the near surface layers and we're we just went ahead and combined all these layers together with an assigned a gradient to that uh, that rock layer so here's our our velocity model we've got these overturned rocks up in here we don't have a lot to work with uh, on the su subsurface seismic data because there's just not much reflectivity. So we just have kind of a general um, uh, velocity model structure over here that carries down from the, sur from the near surface, from the surface geology. And then we've got the syncline, anticline, and syncline uh, in through here that we've interpreted. These numbers represent the velocity, the model velocity at each of these locations. And the numbers are, are oriented in the direction parallel to bedding. And so this is the direction, the velocity in the direction normal to bedding. So 3,291 meters per second is the velocity normal to bedding in this case. The same rock layer uh, sees, uh, has a slightly different velocity as it comes up to surface and then goes back into the subsurface again. And that's because of lithostatic load. The same rock is under a, under a lot of uh, pressure from having uh, two or three kilometers of rock above it. And that's going to, that rock is then going to be less compressible than the same rock unit uh, that only has a few hundred meters of, uh, of rock uh, pushing down on it. So it's already under a lot of pressure and therefore less compressible. And here it's under less pressure and therefore a little bit more compressible. So it has a lower compressional velocity. So this, uh, after several iterations back and forth with the structural geologist coming up with this uh, structural model, and testing out the velocities in the various layers to optimize the image, then we've got, uh, this is the, the image in depth. So we'll just get, we'll zoom in on the, on the right-hand side where we've got uh, significant, uh, uh, you know, strong imaging and significant structuration. And let's just step back to the legacy pre-stack time migration uh, prior to the reprocessing. And, uh, and I've displayed, again, I've displayed all these in time just so we can focus more on the, the lateral position and the imaging differences. Um, so here's the pre-stack time migration. Um, it maybe looks a bit over enhanced in the shallow section. It's optimized to image these uh, deeper reflectors. So we can see the, some improvement in the, um, in the imaging of the subsurface in through here. If we look at the pre-sec time migration compared to the um, Kirchhoff depth migration, again, this anisotropic depth migration, it's a couple of things to note. This syncline in through here, uh, there's we had difficulty getting, uh, even finding an average RMS velocity that could image through the syncline because we've got the rays that image this side of the syncline are going to go through normal to bedding direction and parallel to bedding direction. And there's a lot of difficulty get finding one average RMS velocity that could image down in through this tight syncline. Whereas when we correct for the anisotropy, then we'll have travel times that, uh, that run, uh, you know, parallel to bedding and then perpendicular to bedding and then hit the target and then go perpendicular to bedding and then parallel to bedding and then back up to the surface. And so this complexity is managed much better. And uh, it's, a, it's a good sign that, uh, that if we the imaging, the seismic data has responded and shown us that this is a more accurate representation of the subsurface velocity structure by correcting for the anisotropy in, this, in these laterally varying dips uh, because we've been able to optimize the imaging underneath. And you can see some of the lateral position changes. The structure gets broader. And so the structures under, under anticlines get broader. Structures under synclines get smaller um, and, and shrink up a little bit in through here. Now, under, in the foot wall of the structure, uh, we're able to get more coherency carrying through on some of these. And this is where reverse time migration um, does, um, uh, does a really good job uh, underneath this very steep, uh, steeply dipping and dramatic uh, lateral velocity variation, the reverse time migration does a, a, a jo good job in cleaning up uh, some of these reflectors. And we've got, it's easier for us to follow the reflectivity through the syncline in the foot wall with the RTM than we're able to, it's much more difficult 
with uh, Kirchhoff. Uh, There's this more difficulty imaging underneath here. And that's the, the Kirchhoff assumptions are breaking down a little bit underneath this fault. There's also a couple of other little, little details. If we look at the RTM underneath here, where we've got this underneath the radically varying uh, dip in the near surface, there's just, there are some wave propagation effects that, that Kirchhoff is maybe breaking down uh, in this area and they're able to connect up more reflectivity with the reverse time migration. Very subtle, the differences are very subtle with the RTM. We don't actually do a lot of RTM work because um, you, do, there, you basically require three things. There needs to be a significant velocity inversion, steeply dipping velocity inversion in order for Kirchhoff to break down uh, enough that RTM shows its value. And, uh, and, and this is these, the value here is pretty subtle. We need to have very accurate representation of the subsurface velocities because it's a very delicate process and we need to have very high signal to noise. So if we look at if we look at the uh, the other side of the data set, data set over here on the more complex area where we have more model uncertainty and lower signal to noise, then here's the pre time migration and here's the uh, Kirchhoff death migration. Now the Kirchhoff death migration is able to get uh, uh, more detail and correlating with the surface geology much better over and through here with these very steep dips. And we're getting some detail in here. It's maybe just a different perspective on the interpretation, but we are seeing some uh, coherency, coherent events on the on the Kirchhoff depth that we didn't maybe see as well in the time. Although I like some of this detail in here, and, and it, it would take the geologist to decide what uh, which geometry worked better. So it just provides the alternative perspective in the more a noisy data area. Now here's where RTM is really breaking down. So the uncertainty in the velocity model and the low signal to noise, RTM is broken down and is not providing much value on that end of it. Okay, with well, 30 seconds Rob. left, yes. I am uh, going to my just summarize quickly. Um, dipping clastic rocks create problems with coherency and reflector position on the structures below. Interpretation input and geologic constraints are required to optimize uh, the imaging velocity model. As we apply increasingly accurate imaging algorithms, each algorithm is more sensitive to low signal to noise ratios and velocity errors. So as we increase both accuracy, and, so we increase both accuracy and sensitivity, like the delicate nature of the algorithm, as we go from pre-stack time migration, the most robust algorithm in our toolkit, to pre-stack death migration, so Kirchhoff death imaging, which is more accurate and, and more delicate, and then RTM, which is just slightly more accurate um, and, uh, and uh, even more sensitive. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'd, I'd be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, can you listen to me? Yes, I can hear you, yeah. Okay, so we have a question here from Sergio Chavez Perez. Uh, the question is in practice, how complicated is it to determine all required anisotropic parameters, Thomson parameters in practice? How complicated is it to determine all those parameters? Um, one could argue that it is impossible. So the uh, <laughs> so very very complicated is what I'm saying, um, and uh, the reason for it here. Let me get my stop sharing, and then maybe I'll turn on my camera. Um, so. The, uh, the, in the areas that we work, uh, we basically treat it as an inverse modeling exercise. So what we do is we, uh, we start with uh, epsilon of 0.12, delta of 0.03, um, which we find on average actually does a pretty good job correcting for the, uh, uh, correcting for the effect of anisotropy over, over multiple layers over the, of the well, larger classic overburden. So, and of course the dip is very sensitive to dip. So we wanna build a, an accurate dip model. Now, um, if we have, um, so there are, the justification for that is, we know that, that they, we know their epsilon of 12%, delta of 3% are, are probably inaccurate, but we know they're much closer to the true values than epsilon of zero and delta of zero 
which is an isotropic case, and and we know that's that the rocks aren't aren't isotropic. So that uh, so that's that's our starting point, and then uh, and then we build our our velocity model that way using you know the standard diagnostics and uh, and and image testing. So we test different scenarios, see how the data responds to the different scenarios, and and, it, and include the geologist in that in that whole process. Now, if we find ourselves, and we've only really in the thousands of projects we worked on over the years, uh, if we find us, we've only had a, a, a handful, a dozen maybe projects where, where we've had a significant depth missed tie uh, that indicated that we needed to, uh, to correct, for, you know, have a more accurate correction for anisotropy. So, for example, East Lost Hills, California in the United States um, is very shaly, very shaly overburden. And um, and then we we did the anisotropic death migration, and the they had a significant depth missed tie with the isotropic death migration. We did the anisotropic death migration; everything moved up a, a large a large uh, vertical shift in in depth, and we got quite close. But we were still deeper than the well depth, so the de well depth was here, and the seismic reflector depth was here. So our logic was okay. Well, if correcting for anisotropy uh, with 12 and 3 um, that improved the imaging and also resulted in a closer depth tie then uh, well if we had uh, higher values for anisotropy and uh, decreased our velocity when we could sh we could get the imaging to you know maintain quality imaging and then the structure would move up further so we ended up with epsilon of 0.1 0.18 and we left the delta at 0 0.03, so we increase the analyticity, just to get technical on it, the difference between that epsilon delta, and um, and then we found, and then we could decrease the velocity and still keep our image gathers reasonably flat. And the the thing that we found was we were able to get the depth to tie. Also, there there were some imaging improvements of deeper reflectors below the well, so that was a, a very exciting uh, you know result from that. Um, and we've had a, maybe two or three times where we've significant, where we've just you know maybe slightly modified the anisotropic values to get uh, to get to match, um, and uh, and we had one in um, the most dramatic one for me personally, uh, which was a, a surprise. It was in a rift basin in Central Africa, and we had uh, as it turns out it was such a massive uh, sandstone section that had almost no shales and not even much layering. Um, and the, the layering was on a very large scale, a, a size of wavelength scale. And, uh, and we had uh, the VSP had indicated that the imaging velocity, the, the, the velocity should be, uh, should be lower. And uh, on our, our, our reflector depth, sorry, that should be our, our model velocity should be higher. And our seismic image reflector depth was, was too high. So the well was here, our image was here. And we said, okay, well, we obviously overcorrected for anisotropy uh, because of this massive shaley thing. And in, in the end, we went, uh, it was isotropic. It was the only time in uh, whatever, almost 20 years now, of uh, where we've done uh, isotropic death migration um, because of this massive shale, a massive uh, sandstone section uh, that was actually isotropic. And it's the only time I've seen that. So I call it the exception that proves the rule and that we actually have come across it and uh and and it, it and we needed to change that anyway so that that's my my long answer to say uh, it's uh it's very difficult to come up with all the, and that was the the big argument against doing anisotropic death migration years ago was that well we can't the argument was we can't it's hard for us to come up with the velocity model with the v in the in the in the for a parameter for the death migration then how is it going to be possible that we have to come up with a v with the epsilon with delta and, and and dip but well we can model all those things and uh, and then perturb our models until we get an accurate image and that's the strategy we've taken here's another thank you very much here's another question from massimo in spain okay um, massimo yeah so besides curry cough and rtm what other algorithms are um, used in such a complex um, uh, framework yeah, good question. Um, and really, uh, I mean, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of seismic imaging algorithms, uh, and, and they're specifically designed for certain cases. The reason we go from you know pre-site time migration to Kirchhoff depth to all the way to RTM 
and in between, there are a lot of different ways to, you know, there's, uh, for example, there's anisotropic time migration, but that only works in the VTI case where you've got horizontal layers or, or the HTI case where you've got, you know, vertical stress field. So azimuthal anisotropy. So they're based on specific assumptions. So those don't really work in a foothill setting. Um, in terms of between um, uh, Kirchhoff and RTM, there are other wave equation type methods, other finite difference methods, phase shift plus, plus correction, and other other one way uh, wave equation. But we can't use the one way wave equations because we have got such rough topography. So we need to use uh, we need to to have um, a, a receiver wave field. That where the receivers all have this rough topography and a source wave field where each source can have all of its uh, different reflector locations. And we have to treat the, the source wave field differently from the receiver wave field. And that's basically the fundamental difference between uh, like some of these finite difference methods or phase shift methods and, uh, and RTM is RTM is the two way wave equation method. And we just need that because of rough topography and near surface complexity. Thank you, Rob. Another, um, is there any other question? Anybody wants to? Okay, here we go. Another question from Johnny Calderon. In your opinion, is, is it better to include the near surface velocities prior to run an isotropic PSDM? Ooh, hey, that's a good one. Um, and yes, uh, it's difficult in practice to do, but, uh, you know, like the near surface velocities. So I, I assume you're talking about, uh, refraction, you know, the refraction tomography, uh, velocities that we get from the first breaks. And that's very valuable information. The, the near surface is, like I said earlier, the lens through which we image the subsurface and, and there's so little fold, uh, you know, one or two fold up in the near surface. So really the only velocity information that we have in the near surface is their refraction, uh, you know, from the refraction, uh, refraction inversion, the refraction tomography that we get from the shots, and it can be very valuable. And so we like to use where we can. It it does in practice. We, there are a lot of difficulties logistically to to incorporating that near surface layer, and and when we have to have, uh, and how do we smooth it and other factors. But it, it's really a powerful method uh, for uh, for correcting for the near surface velocities. And um, the only, I guess, the other thing implementation-wise that makes it tricky is we already have static shifts on our data. So we've already have a little bit of the refraction information because of the, the static corrections that we've applied to our data. And, um, and then, uh, so then we have to back that off or, or integrate the weathering solution into the data. But those are just uh, details. Um, so there's a couple ways to do it. The two ways to do it is that we can just uh, paste it in, copy paste, the velocities from the, the near surface velocities into our velocity model, and that's great. The other one we can do, if we don't want to do that, is that we can use it as a guide so that we know where the mountain, like the high velocities are coming to surface. Sometimes you get a really good near surface velocity model and it reads like a structural geology map. You know, you've got these high velocities where the carbonates are coming to surface, for example. And, and that can be a really great uh, geologic constraint to the velocity model. Thank you. Is there any other question for Rob? Rob, I have a question. How do you make use of uh, borehole measurements for building your anisotropic uh, depth migration models? And I mean, VSP measurements, for instance. Yeah, VSPs are much better than sonic, um, the sonic logs because you've got, uh, you're closer to the seismic wavelength and you've, and you've got a, you know, a larger, uh, you're sampling the velocities over a larger area. Plus, you end up with cumulative travel time. My favorite way, par part of the problem with using VSPs is that uh, the calculation of interval velocities can be a bit unstable and you end up with, you know, their velocity curve ends up being a bit funny. One thing I like to do is that if we just take the VSP uh, travel times that we observed and would graph them out, uh, so VSP travel time versus depth curve, um, that we just, that's what we record in the, in the, in the field. And then if we take our velocity model and then uh, calculate uh, along the well trajectory, we can calculate the travel time along the well trajectory through our velocity model. And then we, you can use that as our, our curve for comparison. You know, we can see where the, uh, the, the two travel time curves that we observe with the VSP 
and we calculate from our velocity model deviate from each other and then and that is a, a very powerful uh, tool um, you know it, it's all we always get this thing with um, uh, we can use it as a guide generally uh, but I, it, it's the I think the most uh, reliable when we look at it in terms of travel times just because of the potential instability of uh, interval velocity calculation from the VSPs. Okay, good. Um, if anybody wants to have the last uh, question before we close. Rob, on behalf of the uh, SAOVG, the Society of the uh, uh, Geophysical Engineers in Venezuela, we'd like to thank you for your presentation today, for taking your time and sharing your knowledge on um, an isotropic depth migrations. Thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you. Okay, well, this is the end of the event. Thank you everybody for attending. And we'll see you next month uh, with the presentation on heavy oil, um, seismic inversion by Joaquin Aristimuño. Thank you very much. And uh, the uh, event has finished. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Okay, thank you, Rob, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.